Hi, Steve. I'm Max. Nice to meet you. Thanks for speaking with me today. How do you feel that play and optimism help kids overcome adversity? That's a great question, man. Well, let me talk a little bit first about optimism. Um, because this is about spreading the power of optimism. And I want to be super clear, Max, like optimism doesn't mean you ignore the bad stuff, you ignore the hard stuff, you live in a fantasy world that everything is great and everything is beautiful. No, that's not optimism. That's denial. What optimism is about is that even though the world has challenges, even though there's struggles, even though there's suffering or fear, that you never lose your ability to see the goodness and value in yourself, the goodness and value in others, and the goodness and value and opportunities in the world around you. Um, so, you know, an optimist, you know, never, you know, I mean, sometimes we're all human beings, so sometimes we might lose a little bit of a sense of optimism, but for the most part, an, an optimist looks at ways that they can take their blessings, tap into their community, take all the goodness and value and use that in a positive way to, to change the world in little ways. And I think every time you, you take some kind of action to help somebody or to make their life you know, a little bit better because you were there to help along the way, I mean, that if you can't, you know, being an optimist is what allows you to do that because you see your goodness and value and you say, hey, I can actually do something. And then you see the goodness and value in the other person next to you. And so that they, you know, that you feel motivated to reach out because they're, you know, they're a strong, special human being. Um, and then play, you know, I look at play. So if I think about hard times and, you know, I know Max, you've had hard times. Your dad has had hard times. I've had hard times. And you've had challenges probably that most people can only imagine. And, um, but this idea of play and think about when you're, you know, when you're on the basketball team, you know, there's joy. You know, joy is being able to feel this sense of pleasure and purpose. And then the big thing is you feel socially connected. You feel connected to the team and to the other athletes. And you're part of that. Play allows you to feel connected to other people. And then when you're playing and you're with that basketball team, you're not thinking about other stuff. You're focused on that game. So you're allowed to engage in life in that moment. And then I'm sure all those things make you feel good about who you are. Make you feel like you can contribute something, that you're valuable. Um, and... You know, all of those things are what happens to kids when they play in the right way, especially when they're playing with other kids. If they play is a way we can help children to feel a sense of joy, connection, empowerment, and engagement. So it's not about the play, specifically that play is good. It's about how the play can strengthen relationships and strengthen children. Um, and I also think, man, everything can be play. You know, if you have joy, if you have connection, if you're empowered, if you're inspired, well, man, you're playing. I'm going to quit my job when I stop playing it because I don't want to work too hard. I want to play hard. And that doesn't mean I'm not motivated or passionate or want to achieve a lot of stuff. But whatever I'm doing, I want to be able to make sure I can find joy and meaning and connection and feel like I'm actually making a difference like like you're doing right now, dude. You know, you're making a difference. You're showing people that, hey, no matter what my challenges are, I can make an impact in the world by interviewing folks, by helping out a basketball team, by showing other people who may be dealing with similar challenges that, hey, life is good and that we can do stuff that brings us joy and connection. So I hope I answered the question pretty well. I tend to talk a lot, dude. So, um, Why is play so important? What does it teach kids and adults? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, man. And I think what play is so important is because play, um, you know, when I, when I think about, there's a quote, and I forget who said it, and I'm not even sure if you look at it up in the internet that it's the right person. I think they say it's like Socrates 
or some somebody, you know, some great philosopher that says you can learn more about a person in an hour of play than in a lifetime of conversation. And, you know, I think that when we are playing, when we are engaged in something that brings us joy and connection, that it's really important. And then figuring out how to play, think about all the learning that takes place. Like just think about the learning of, you know, being on the basketball team. Well, number one, you start to learn that, wow, I, it's not just about me, that we're gonna do better as a team if we work together as a team, if we, if we play to everyone's strengths, if we work together, we can accomplish more than any individual. And that's an important lesson because our world needs that lesson. You know, it shouldn't be about me, me, me. It's gotta be about we, we, we. And, uh, you know, so that's one really important thing. The other thing play does is it shows kids, it allows kids to explore and learn about the world and imagine. And so like when kids are playing with little toys or, or animals and making voices and creating scenarios, you know, they're, they're exploring their world. You know, there was a great quote. Um, and again, I think it was Maria Montessori who says that play is the work of children. And, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes as adults, we stop playing. We think that playing is not important. Um, but in the human life, it is important that we sustain joy. It is important that we have connection. It is important that we have fun. Because when you have fun, you know, imagine when you have fun and you're doing something, you want to do it more. And then the more you do it, the better you get at it. So, you know, teachers who look at school, we got to make school more like play. You know, if you want kids to, to learn science, you got to bring joy to science. You got to bring connection, inspiration. You got to find activities or ways of teaching that captivate kids. You know, when I remember when I was a kid, you know, if you're looking out the window because you're focusing on a little bird that flew on a tree and the teacher gets mad because, you know, why aren't you paying attention to the class? You're looking out the window at the bird. Well, maybe the bird is more interesting. You know, so I think in some ways it's the teacher's job to make what's happening in the moment as interesting as looking at the birds outside. It's not easy work. The teacher, I think a great teacher um, that is a playmaker, it's some of the most challenging work. It's, it's a work of art. Um, but yeah, man, play is important, not just for kids, for all of us. Because I'm going to throw one more quote to be my last one, but I love quotes. And um, I forget who said it, but they said, you know, um, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. And I think that all of us, um, human beings, we need to play throughout our lifespan or we're not going to appreciate the fullness and beauty of life. Can you tell me a bit about your background and how you came to be chief playmaker at Life is Good? Wow, man, you asked the best questions, dude. Um, my background, okay. So I grew up, I'm 54 years old right now, and I am married to a wonderful woman, and I have three beautiful children. And um, I was very fortunate, very privileged to grow up um, in a household that had a lot of love. Um, but like every household, there's challenges. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that I had growing up was that, you know, um, my big brother had some, some of his own kind of mental health issues. And, you know, I saw him suffer a lot. And I saw the challenge of, you know, what happens to people when, when they don't feel safe, when they don't feel joyful, when they don't feel connected. Um, and then, you know, I just always loved to play. I love sports. Um, I wasn't very good at them, but I still, I still tried and I still played. And um, I found out that, you know, one of the things that I was good at with sports was not playing the game, but sometimes as I grew older, like playing with other kids and helping to, bring, helping to create an environment where they could find joy and connection and feel good about themselves through play. And uh, I ended up doing some counseling work 
when I got out of school, um, counseling children, but not by talking with them, but using play and using group games. And then we talked a little bit during that play, but while they were playing, we could address all the issues that they were dealing with. You know, for instance, some kids who had a lot of fear, you could see that in the play because they didn't want to try stuff. Or kids that had a hard time connecting with other kids, you could see it in the play because they couldn't work cooperatively with the team. Um, and so we could help by helping that child to engage successfully in fun stuff. It really helped them. And I was like, okay, this is my, this is my lot in life because everyone has something that they can share with the world, everybody. And this was the one thing I felt like I could share with the world. And then I think I thought a lot about my brother and the suffering and suffering that people have. And I said, if I'm going to do this work, I want to do it with people who, you know, don't have as many options, who don't have all the privilege that I had. Um, and so I started to really focus on homeless and impoverished children and um, recognizing that that was the most meaningful thing in my life because of my dad. Um, you know, I think I told your dad, but I, I lost my father. Um, he passed away about almost a year ago. And uh, he was my role model. He was my inspiration. He's the reason that I got attracted to this work because he would tell me all the time, he said, listen, nobody has control over their birth. We don't know why we're born, but somehow we're here. And then he says, and most people, we don't have much control over our death either. Eventually, someday, like every living thing, we're going to die. And we don't have control over that. But we do have control of making somebody else's journey from birth to death better because we were there to help along the way. And that has always been the secret that being of service, being helpful to others and allowing others to be helpful to you um, and being vulnerable and helping folks who are vulnerable, that just, that message stuck with me. And so I wanted to make a difference in people's lives, but I didn't have a lot of skills to do that. It wasn't like, I, you know, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer who can advocate for groups. or I wasn't a, a builder who could build homes for people. I wasn't a chef who could feed people, but I was a guy who liked to play and enjoy playing with children and helping them to enjoy play. And so I figured that would be my contribution to help people. But mostly, Max, I mean, I wanna be honest, the person I'm helping the most is myself. Um, and I, I think that's okay. I think it's okay as long as your need to help yourself doesn't take pr priority over the, you know, your desire to help other people. And I think that people who serve others actually get almost, they get as much or more benefit from serving than the people who they serve get from being served. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about my background. Give you a little bit more. I went to UMass Amherst. Um, I grew up in Needham, as I said, I went to UMass Amherst. I was a lousy student, but I did pretty good. I still figured out ways to get some decent grades. And then I went to Boston College to go to the School of Social Work. And that's where I learned a lot about, you know, um, social work and counseling. And then I had met great people along the way who helped to, prov to provide opportunities for me. Do you ever work with sports teams or use team sports to help kids overcome challenges they are facing? You know, that's a great question. I would love you know, someday to work with, like, you know, just as a hobby, just, just as something like for me personally, like I always think of how cool it would be if professional sports team or a college sports team, you know, wanted to work with their athletes about the importance of joy and connection and empowerment. Like, because I think, you know, everyone could kind of benefit from this work, but the mission or the group, like I've worked with a lot of coaches, and to try to teach, you know, share this philosophy with coaches so that they can share it with kids. Um, so yes, I've worked with lots of coaches and people at the boys and girls clubs. And, um, you know, personally, I also, you know, as I mentioned, I, I like to coach. So, because, you know, I think that for me, 
when a young boy or young girl plays a sport, it's more important that they experience joy, they learn to be part of a team, they love the sport, they have fun, they're inspired, than learning you know, to shoot a perfect jump shot or to rip a baseball. And I think those things are important when you're an athlete. But in the early phases, it's just as important to help kids to feel a sense of joy and connection and love the freaking game because it's a game, you know, it's a game. The umpire doesn't say work ball, they say play ball. And when you see an athlete, and I know Max, you'd appreciate it, that loves the game, man, they're so fun to watch. They love the game. They play with everything they got. You know, I think about a guy like, you know, Julian Edelman. You know, I don't know if you like, or, or sometimes I think of Kemba Walker and his smile and guys that just love to play. Um, and then there's guys that sports is just a business to them. They lost their love of the game. And, you know, they might, they might be admirable in their ability to perform, but it's just not as fun to watch them. Um, so I think we got to make sure we put sports in the right, you know, sports should be enjoyable and sports should be um, inclusive and sports should allow everyone to feel like they're part of something special and that they can contribute on some level. What inspires you most about the kids you get to meet and work with? Uh, you know, I think what inspires me most is their determination, their courage their grit, their ability to, you know, their motivation and drive to want to feel joy, to want to trust, to want to connect, to want to play, even though a lot of things that have happened to them have sometimes made it difficult. So when kids have had a lot of really bad stuff happen to them, well, it's sometimes hard to let go of that and have some fun. But kids are always inspired and motivated to try to have some fun. Um, it's sometimes really hard to trust other people. But they open their hearts and they, they, let, you, they let you in. And they allow you to, to, you know, to be part of their life and to, be, to create a trusting relationship with them. Um, you know, I, I love kids because they got superpowers. You know, I mean, sometimes I look at kids and I see, you know, Adults need to be more like kids sometimes. Um, and in that kids are always willing to try stuff in general. They're motivated to explore, to have fun. They're, they show love. They accept people. Um, they're so, they can be so creative. And, um, you know, so I admire kids in general. But I really admire, I admire even probably a little bit more kids who still show those superpowers, even though life is kind of beating them up a little bit and sometimes a lot of it. And um, their courage, I sometimes think, wow, what if that stuff had happened to me? Would I be that courageous? Like, could I, you know, be as, you know, open and compassionate and courageous as some of the kids I work with? Um, and I can only imagine because as I said before, you know, I, I've had in lots of ways up to these 40 and 54 years, a charmed life. I've had a lot of people who love me. I've had a lot of great experiences. I've had a lot of fun. I haven't suffered a lot of trauma and challenges. Um, and so when I see people work through that stuff, I just admire their strength and their courage. How can people support the Life is Good Kids Foundation and your mission? Ah, uh, man, just that's a great question. Well, I think one of the first things that I would like to say about that is I think one of the best ways you support the Life is Good Kids Foundation and our mission is that you find that you, whoever you are, what you know, are you motivated um, or able? to kind of bring more optimism into your life and not the fake kind. But what I mean by that is 
being able to work to see your goodness and to see your value. Um, that's not always, that's not always easy for people. Um, it's not easy for me sometimes, you know, like everybody you have insecurities. So whatever you need to do, whoever you need to meet with, like I've had some great counselors in my life, some great friends in my life, but I work hard to be able to see my worth and see my value. I want people to be able to do that work. I would really, you know, would love for people to try even harder to see the worth and value of the people around them. Even people who are very different from them. Even people who have very, you know, people have different ideas, different races, different ethnicities, different sexual orientation, different Republican, Democrat. Um, you know, how do we see each other's worth? How do we seek to understand you know, that's, that's a really important thing. So I think practicing and bringing optimism into your life, into the lives of the people you know, I think is really important. Um, and then if people want to get involved, well, they can email me and um, we can show them how to give. They can go on to um, lifeisgood.com and they can click on 10% for kids to see about the social work that we do and they can make a donation. Um, and and I don't like to say that that's the only way to help. I think the way to help is to practice the very principles of our organization and, um, and, and, and put them into your own life. Because um, at the end of the day, nobody's joy is more important than your own. Nobody's love and connection is more important than your own. No, no one's um, self-worth is more important than your own because you can't share with other people what you don't have for yourself. And so get a little more optimism in your life. Um, you know, uh, buy life is good clothing or buy life is good product if you like it and it resonates with you because, you know, 10% of the profits from everything sold at life is good go to support our social mission, which is helping kids overcome the impact of poverty, violence, and illness. Um, and, you know, making a donation would be great. Making a donation would be great. And I can show you just how to do that. Um, my email is steve at lifeisgood.com. And uh, check out lifeisgood.com and explore the website. Buy some clothing. Learn more about our social mission. And, um, you know, um, bring the power of optimism to yourself and share it with as many people as you can.